The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. G'day, Clayton here from Ensemble. Thanks for joining me for this podcast. It's a pleasure to be able to do this from time to time. Hopefully you enjoy. If you're not already on Ensemble, please go to Ensemble.com or find us in the App Store. You can't buy time, but you can save it. The advisor portal at MLC Life Insurance is just one way we're helping advisors streamline the advice process. Using the advice portal, advisors can generate quick quotes and indicative underwriting decisions in one place. This means less time spent on paperwork and more time focused on clients. To learn more about the MLC Life Insurance Advisor Portal and how it will save you time, visit our website or contact your distribution representative. G'day, Clayton here from Ensemble. Today, I'm chatting with Jeff from Evolesco. Mate, thank you so much for coming in. Thanks for having me, Clayton. Yeah, I, when we caught up in Cebu, we were over there for the VBP conference. Um, it dawned on me that, I, I mean, I've crossed paths with you so many times over the years and uh, you've got this amazing business over there at Evolesco. I realized we've never actually had the chance to sit down and, and discuss things. And I'd sort of hung up the what do you call them, the the gloves of podcasting a little while ago. But I, I, I thought if you're available, it would be great to sort of sit down and chat because I've seen you like at all of the, I would call it the um, the evolution of advice events and, and whatever whatever um, is going on in, in the industry, you seem to be a part of it. And so I figured there's probably a couple of sort of big picture questions that we can cover off together, which I'm sure a lot of advisors would be um, excited to hear from you. So let's kind of kick off with um, where do you think advice is headed? I think that's probably like as big a picture as one can imagine. So um, if that's something that you're comfortable with tackling, mate, please uh, feel free to share. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. And, and likewise, you know, it's been great to see what you've been doing with the ensemble business and, you know, watching from the edge, the fringes of that. It's pretty uh <laughs> Pretty amazing what you're doing there. So Thanks, it's great man. to reconnect in Cebu and uh, yeah. catch up. Um, for me, I mean, we just came off the back of a conference that we had with our team and, and our license in Melbourne last week. And the theme for that was the best is yet to come. And so in terms of where I think advice is heading, I genuinely believe that that is the case. And, and the best of advice is, and the best of life for the participants is, is yet to come. Yeah. And for me, I was saying to our team, that's really exciting because I've been working in the industry for 26 years and I've had an amazing time. Like I feel very grateful, very fortunate for what I've experienced in terms of, yeah, the purpose of what we do, the people I've got to know, the conferences and, you know, fun times and being able to make a good living and build a business that I'm really proud of. Um, so that's already been amazing. So to think that it's going to get better. Absolutely. is so exciting. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, we've obviously, in saying that, acknowledging that we've been through a pretty tough time in, in many ways and, and for many people over the last few years, I mean, as a general society, but, you know, within the industry off the back of the Royal Commission and the changes that have come there. But um, I feel like we're kind of pushing out the end of that now and there's some real light at the end of the tunnel. So I think that, yeah, the demographic changes, increasing demand and, you know, decreased supply in the industry means that, that that's really powerful um, drivers for where we're going to go. Mm. I think there's some opportunities for different business models to emerge. It's been a, you know, pretty much a one-way, same-way sort of model, a lot driven by the regulation and the compliance side of things. Yeah. Um, so I think now, hopefully, we'll be able to be in a position where we can adapt to market forces and, and really be more customer-centric around business models as well. Um, and technology will be a big part of that, but I think there's lots of evidence to suggest it won't be just about technology. So that might be a solution yeah. for a certain segment, but it might be part of the solution for the broader segment. So there's still a really strong role for advisors to play. Do you think uh, if the way that you approach business, would you look at splitting, would you would you ever want to address multiple markets at once or stay in one? Yeah, well, we, we do address multiple markets and I think it's been to our detriment for a lot of the time of, of the business. Yeah. Um, we've probably tried too hard for too long to find a solution 
um, to the. That's pretty common as well. Yeah. I yeah. Think so. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's because, you know, we all got into this to help as many people as we could. And totally. it's still, still the motivation for growing a business. But um, we probably tried too hard for too long to address that smaller segment of the market because that's, you know, that's where we were and that's where our advisors were. We wanted to help our cohort. Yeah. Um, and I think, but when, when we tried that, we probably still tried to force our tried and tested model onto a segment that wasn't really suited for that model. But maybe we, you know, we didn't know any difference and maybe the legislation or the regulation, that could be an excuse, you know, didn't kind of allow us to go there. But I think there will be some opportunities to do that. Yes. Um, and cover the, a slightly broader segment of the market. So, you know, we, we still do look at, you know, look at accumulators as an important part of our business, but we're probably now looking at, you know, slightly wealthier accumulators, slightly higher income earning accumulators, slightly older accumulators than what we would have at the start of the, the journey. Yeah, I had an really interesting conversation with uh, an advisor um, just a week or two ago, someone with a high pro- uh, high profile, and they were saying that they'd sort of gone from, you know, when they first started, maybe a couple hundred thousand dollars to 500,000 to 800,000 to 1.2 to two uh, over a hand, you know, like sort of five or six, seven years. And then they went backwards one year and the and and the the reason for it was they spent a huge amount of time coming up with courses and looking to develop a sort of a way to address the mass market and um that was that was pretty compelling in terms of hearing that as soon as you know what you're doing but then try to expand on the scope of what your business handles it does make things a little bit more difficult. And then so that strategy was parked and now, yeah, it's up and running again and and, and the growth is good. So with with scalable advice, I kind of look at the the investment options that are out there. Um, I mean, there's money soft and open invest and there's a, there's a bunch of kind of tech companies that are out there that allow financial planners to compete in, in the scalable process. Um, but I, I I haven't actually seen someone handle the top end and and the sort of lower end. Uh, but I mean, there's there's guys like uh, Vince Scully who have done extraordinarily well on on the on the scalable end. Um, I think he last look he had four thousand clients or something wow. like that. It was quite amazing. Yeah. Uh, and so yeah, the the opportunities are certainly there. Um, but it, 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 it does, l- at least to my mind, look a little bit hard unless unless you're using kind of one, like, you, you, yeah, using a, 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 like building your own membership site and creating your own courses. That looks pretty, pretty difficult. Whereas, you know, there might be other solutions out there that allow you to sort of plug and play and go straight away. That's kind of what I've observed anyway. Yeah, no, I agree 100%. And it's easy to get distracted. Um, yeah. when you're in a business and the opportunity it looks like a great opportunity yeah I think one of the areas which I do see and I've seen a couple of presentations recently which and I'll, and I'll circle back to the point you're making is um, the intergenerational wealth transfer mm. and so that's a massive opportunity and a massive challenge for for people and you know the stat I saw was 68 percent of high net worth clients want to have a conversation about intergenerational wealth transfer and think they might need some advice at some point and so where that sort of circles back is if you can have a proposition which allows you to bring in the next generation and possibly even the generation under that to have that conversation, start providing the edu- education, that's a service which is really helpful to the you know, matriarch or patriarch of the family because yeah. you're helping them with that conversation. But they then will possibly want a different, you know, that younger generation will want a different solution. So mm-hmm. it may be a place where you can have a consistent philosophy roll that out to a different solution. So that may be something that kind of ties in with your core proposition in the business, but as you expand it, if you know what I mean by that. Yeah, no, definitely. That that makes so you you're essentially creating a lower cost, uh more scalable service offering, but it's all it's almost like the business model light. It's the light business model. And you're almost even delivering that as a part of the package to the to the full service client. Yeah. That's right. And then in our business it might be that you know, the matriarchal patriarch at, you know, the wealthier end of the family are dealing with myself or with Marshall. Yeah. But the younger younger 
clients, younger members of the family might not necessarily want to talk to the old blokes. They might want to talk to <laughs> some of the younger advisors and get advice from them. So yeah. there's an opportunity for a business like ours to you know, cater for that and be a little bit flexible in that space. So, yes. And that to me is a bit more of a compelling reason to think about you know, that more you know, online solution, the more direct kind of solution as opposed to you know, totally turning our business model to focus on that. Yes. It, yeah, I, I've always said, and, and I honestly believe it, I think financial planning would be one of the last business models to be disrupted. I've always, it, I know when robo-advice first came out, there was a sort of, a, you know, about a decade ago, there was somewhat of a worry that, oh, well, people can access uh, low-cost ETFs. But I mean, it's quite funny now to look at that in hindsight and be like, well, that you know didn't get close. Mm. And if, but of course, and 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 because advisors uh, have been saying for a long time that financial planning is much more than than just putting someone into low cost ETFs. One of the elements that I think, or one of the professions that I think is is a very close analogy, is something like psychology. And so I've always kind of thought, well, the day that someone picks up a their iPhone and says, um, I, I, ca- I can't even give an, give an example because the voice will start talking to me, but, but, <laughs> but insert name, S-I-R-I, I had a bad day to- today and uh, you know I'd love to talk about it. I think that's still a while away um, to have sort of that close of, a, of, a, of an emotional relationship um, to technology. Um, but then something really strange came along. Um there was, I can't remember the name of it, but there was a, a relationship AI. And, uh, and it, what it was, was it, it, there was some sort of subscription fee and this AI became uh, a, like a partner, a girlfriend or a boyfriend, right? Yeah, right. And that, it, it, not, it didn't like take off, take off. It, you know, it's for a very sort of small segment of the market. But the fact that it even had an iota of of uptake sort of did change my mind in the sense that maybe we're not as far away from AI disrupting financial planning as I originally thought. I think it still is the one of the last. I think that in psychology will be the last. And for example, I, you know, I if if you were to ever uh, go up to one of your wealthy clients and say, hey, do you want to use this chatbot instead? I'm pretty sure what the answer is going to be. Yeah. So so I think there's going to be a, a, a huge moat around financial planning still for some time. But have you seen sort of how the latest generation of artificial intelligence could potentially work within uh, the financial advice process? Yeah, absolutely. I think... Um Certainly not an expert in this area, but really interested in what it can do. And we, I was having a good conversation over dinner with some friends um, the other night, and um, they'd been reading a bit about some AI, and they talked about the disruption, and they talked about the medical industry as an example of where they think there could be disruption. And the, you know, their hypothesis out of the book was that doctors themselves could potentially be dis- disrupted pretty easily by AI because you can you know type in the symptoms or you can do a scan and put some tests in and it can do that processing behind the scenes but nurses would be really hard to disrupt because they're the ones providing that human you know the bedside manner and the yeah that engagement and i kind of look at that as a bit of an analogy for you know what we do it's that you know bedside manner yes it's that questions it's you know um the human touch yes but if you can use the tools and the technology to really run, you know, best next next, next actions and um, modeling and that sort of stuff where AI can do that and, and technology can do that. So if you can find the way of, you know, pairing those together, I think that's a really powerful opportunity. Yeah, because I think one of the things that just talking, looking, eyeballing someone for lack of a better term mm. is uh, a computer might know the right answer but you can't talk to a computer in the sense that the computer can't say, oh, I've been doing this for 40 years <laughs> and I've seen if you do go down this path, it ends up like this. If you go down this path, it ends up like this. And so it might, yeah, it's the, it is an interesting analogy between doctor and nurse because the nurse is going to go into that experience, their bedside manner, their experience is going to help them talk 
the patients through the situation um, that, yeah, I just, I do find would be very difficult to, for AI. But, and, and interestingly, on, on the topic of AI, I was speaking to a mate of mine that, that's a marketer, he does marketing for financial planners. And when, when marketing first came out, oh, sorry, when, not when marketing, when AI first came out, uh, he, he looks at me and he goes, oh no, like, uh, you know, my job's going to be replaced because all of my clients are going to, rather than work with me to create content, all that sort of stuff, they're, they're going to now just be able to use this AI function. And so this, you know, it all happened at the beginning of the year. And I spoke to him again a week or two ago and I said, how are things? Did it, did it end up doing everything he said? And he said, no, it didn't it it uh people still want to work with me um because the 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 content that's coming out of these ais it's very hard to get the kind of tone mm. that you need it to to operate at yeah. it's it's almost um the way that i like to think about it is on it, it at my inbox sure i have a spam filter but i also have an experience filter in the sense that i can kind of tell if an Im- if a email is going to be worth reading or not just by looking at the preview text, yeah. which, which you know, I'd never train myself, but it's just learnt over time. And I think what's going to happen in terms of content that's written by AI, I think we're, I'd, I'm not sure if we can tell now, but I'm, I think over a long enough period of time, we'll probably be able to tell, we'll end up developing some sort of filter in our minds that, oh, this is AI generated text compared to, um, compared to human generated yeah. text. Um, but in terms of seeing things come and go, like, you know, the financial advice profession has grown a lot in the time that you've been advising. I'm sort of super interested, sure, it might be AI today, but I'm sort of interested to to see, um, you know, you've got this conclusion that advice is better than it's ever going to be ahead of us. And you've got kind of this multi-decade behind. What have you seen over that time come and go in a sense that you thought perhaps this was going to be the thing and but it and it wasn't or perhaps something you didn't expect did end up becoming a big thing yeah good question um there's, there's a lot of stuff i suppose over that period of time that has changed and, and there's some stuff which has remained pretty constant i think in terms of business models have been pretty constant and the way the advice is delivered and i think that's a real opportunity for disruption but i think the uh proposition has changed a fair bit so when i you know, in the early days of, of our business and, and before that, it was a lot about investments. So investment returns and portfolio um, creation was the was the proposition for many firms. Um, I think that's changed now where you've got a acknowledgement of a broader industry, broader skill set, you know, more that goes into that rather than, you know, me sitting up in our office trying to pick the best managed funds and, you know, put those together. Um, so I think that's been a, a positive evolution. I think there is still value, though, in advisors having input into that because advisors have to sit across the table from the client. So if you outsource all of that to investment consultants or all of that to um, fund managers and just leave them on their own, there's a little bit of that disconnect between what an advi- what a client is feeling and saying, and, and I think advisors can really bring some value to that. So yeah. I would encourage advisors to, to stay part of that process. Yeah, building on that theme, it was a lot of product-centered advice was, you know, it was all about the end result was a product and selling that product and receiving some commission or, you know, um, getting paid for that was a big part of it. I think that's that's gone, yeah. which is fantastic yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and as it should be. Um, I think the banks in advice, you know, when I first started, it was insurance companies. So my, my entree into the industry was as an agent of an insurance company and, you know, had a couple of different agencies and did that. And then the banks came in and changed it. And we kind of thought, that the banks would be a real, I guess, positive in terms of what they can do from a technology viewpoint and and bringing their scale and size. But I think they've been a bit of a disappointment in that space. Yeah. And and what it did was there was a real concentration then. So if they weren't going to be the savior for, you know, the technology solutions, then there was no one else. The rest of us were just little, you know, our little business. We can't afford to spend, you know, millions of dollars a year on trying to develop technology. So I think having them, you know, leave the industry maybe opens it up for other people to go, well, now it's on us and we're not going to wait wait for the banks. Having said that, I think the banks and some of the insurance companies did a great job in terms of providing an, an entry point, some, you know, basic training for advisors um, yeah. and, and started that process, which is a bit of a gap now and makes it, you know, something we're grappling with 
uh, I think, as an industry for, for how we get the next people into it. I guess, you know, I'm quite worried about the insurance space. So, you know, it hasn't gone yet, but it's yeah, looking, looking it's a bit shaky. Right? Yeah, yeah. So um, I think it's, yeah, it's really concerning for me. I'm a passionate advocate of, it, of the value of insurance. Of um, and it's interesting when we talk to a lot of people when we're, recruiting or bringing new team members into the team and you say what's you know what's a client scenario or a piece of advice or an outcome that you're really most proud of and I reckon eight times out of ten they'll talk about an insurance claim that they've been part of yeah because that's where the rubber really hits the road it's a one single tangible really valuable moment so um, when we get frustrated insurance is really hard to do at the moment yeah so when you get frustrated try and come back to that and say well you know you can't it's hard to beat that moment when you can provide a family um, the support that they need. So um, hopefully things turn around. I mean, we've invested heavily in that space and are committed to it, but it, it is really hard. So hopefully things turn around and that's not one of those things we're talking about, which is gone yeah. in a couple of years, but it's it's pretty precarious. It's very precarious. I mean, for example, uh, Integrity Life is not uh, writing any new business and that was, goodness, just three, four, maybe a bit longer, maybe eight or nine years um, launched and it had relatively good funding, relatively good management team, um, and yet it's hard to compete. It's hard to exist if yeah. your business flows drop seventy five percent. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, there's some of the things that have come and come and gone. I think um, I don't know. Is there anything else that you know you you had in mind that you've seen or that you think is worth? Oh, exploring? Yeah. So uh, it's I think. Goals-based advice. I don't hear that term as often as I used to. It. I think that was it. Was it was kind of a catch cry for, um, as ever you know, as a, as the financial planning sort of industry as a whole was coming out of the um, out of FOFA. It became this sort of like quick grab this thing yeah. on the wall called goals-based advice. I think that comes back to the um, the proposition was about investments. So when, yeah. when goals-based advice has come out, you know, I, I just kind of look at it and go like, oh, duh. Like, <laughs> isn't, isn't, that just doing, isn't that just doing your job? Yeah. But, I think, <laughs> but I think the difference was because a lot of the stories before that had been about investment portfolios, investment returns. Yeah. It, weren't, it, wasn't, it was understanding, you know, clients retired, wanted to retire. And yeah. That was the goal. Yeah. But there wasn't much else to it. So yeah. I think that was possibly why it was such a big thing. It's like how can you have a broader conversation and expand yeah. out the goals and change your services? But I think a lot of our clients were younger. It wasn't just about the farm. It was about you know cash flow and lending and insurance and and you know super and investments were a part of that. But talking yes. about property and buying your home and that sort of stuff. So yeah. you had to have goals. You had to prioritize along yeah. those all the time. So it wasn't anything kind of terribly different, but. For other people, you know, we were a bit unusual in that space when we started the business. There wasn't a lot of people now. Every, not everybody, but now lots of people are working in that part of that's the space. That's right, yeah. Which, which, and I have, um, I did know that about your company and that's kind of one of the reasons why I wanted to catch up and chat is because there were, you know, let's call it back in the day, <laughs> uh, there were sort of a handful of companies uh, that were already pretty mature in this area um, when FOFA came around. And uh, it, and for for when Ensemble at the time we were XY advisor, you know, nine years ago, um, it realistically it was just a cup, you know, a handful of practice principals who were just trying to figure out what financial planning could be. And and yeah, not speaking to you, uh, it it was pretty clear that there were companies that had sort of were were ahead of the curve and and had made that jump. But then I guess the conversation became, well, how do we get the majority of advisors onto this path and it became yeah almost um comically called goals-based advice um otherwise known as financial planning yeah. and uh, one of the things you said earlier which i thought was quite interesting and if we we'll touch on it if you don't mind but if i think back to me when i started as a financial planner i started in um accounting like accountancy and then i moved across into an smsf um, specific advice firm, and so you know, as a as a graduate, um, I got drilled on the CIS Act quite a lot. So it became you know technical knowledge, technical knowledge. So I sort of had this accounting technical knowledge and the CIS Act technical knowledge, and then I jumped into um, Horizons, 
which was sort of a bit of a baptism by fire and what's not just all about the numbers that um there's also you know you, you have to call people on the phone as well and I was, I was like okay and then so by the time i sort of launched uh, my financial planning business i had a fair bit of technical knowledge um a small amount of sales skills up my sleeve um but i was sort of lucky enough if you want to call it that in I could write insurance, I could do simple advice so, so that it was just time in the game. And then over the course of a handful of years, I, I understood what it meant to be a financial planner, right? And I was kind of lucky lucky enough to be quite involved with Ensemble back in the day and I was able to learn as much as I could from a lot of people. And so I, I had, let's call it a five-year um, apprenticeship apprenticeship while I was the business owner yep. on top of my handful of years that I'd done in the technical space. That's super hard for a new planner to get anywhere near that sort of level of experience. And and it, but that's what the job is now. So we have and, and and it is difficult to bring people in. And uh on 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 this podcast just recently there was uh a, a really interesting gent that I met actually in Cebu as well. And it was the first time I'd, I'd ever met someone who used to be a management consultant and became a financial planner yeah. and a younger guy. And I, and I was mm. sort of chatting to him about it. And he said, well, you know, I was there for three years and then half of everyone gets fired, right? So, you know, he he got, he, I, actually, I don't know if he was fired or if he was, um, if he left on his own accord. I, I want to be clear on that. But mm-hmm. I do know that his next opportunity was going to pay him quite a lot of money, yeah. right? And he took, all, all, you know, a third of that money to, to start in advice. And the only reason he did that is because he learned about financial planning during his time as a management consultant. Mm-hmm. And what I realized in that moment is it's going to be almost impossible to get people who would have gone into that to come across here. Now, the both of us know that, you know, if you stick around long enough and you, you are going to earn yourself a, a good client base and you're bringing money into your, your practice and you, you, you're you going to earn a, a good career. Yep. Um, but it's hard from day one. It's really hard from day one. It's really hard to find the people with the skill sets. And if, if I was to start uh, a job in a bar, for example, my first day... I'm going to get a shopping a shopping basket. I'm going to walk around. I'm going to collect glasses. There's something for me to day one, do yeah. day one, right? And then eventually you learn what post mix is and the whole thing, right? So you go <laughs> up from there. Um, but what, how, you know, with the banks being out of financial planning, at least for now, um, what is in your mind the best way to get someone? Up and running into a position where they're, you know, they're 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 washing their own face in terms of their own salary, um, and then they're uh, able to actually grow, help grow the business as well. Yeah, it's it's quite a complicated challenge, isn't it? I think, um, I guess, in some ways, the good thing and the bad thing now is that there's an expectation of a certain level of education for people coming into the industry, and so there's more courses available. Um, they're coming in with a bit more of that technical sort of knowledge. Mm. Um, that's for brand new people, which is which is I think fantastic, and they're going to hit the ground running from that viewpoint. The challenge with that is, to your point, salary expectations for somebody who spent three or four years at uni studying are different to potentially someone who'd been a career changer or who, who was willing to start at the bottom in an admin role and work their way up. Yeah. Also, potentially expectations of how quickly you might be sitting in front of clients. Yeah. Because I've done this financial planning degree, I can give advice. And, you know, in, in many ways, they'll be, you know, far superior to me from a technical viewpoint, right? But again, you know, you talked about some of the sales training you got through Horizons and that was, you know, kind of where I started. It was all about, you know, sales and relationship stuff first and then we built the technical stuff on top of it. And I think yeah. that's a gap and a challenge. So I guess to plug that gap, it, it is just about you have to be a little bit more patient. You have to put a little bit more time into it. But I also feel the best advisors have had exposure to the different roles and different parts of the business as they come through. So you know, a good example in our business is um, Hung, who's been with us for 
eight or nine years now. He came to us straight out of uni, um, super smart guy. He's now a senior advisor in our team. So yeah, eight or nine. He was an, he was an advisor after say six or seven years, which which to me is is pretty quick. Yeah. But, but for somebody who's straight out of uni, it may be slow. But for him, he came in as a power planner. Yes. And so he developed his technical skills, and he already had that. Yeah, you know, he did a sub major in financial planning. Yeah, you know, when it was not really a cool thing to do. <laughs> um, and so he had that technical side of things and the strategy, and he'd worked on that. But he'd never never seen the paperwork which was associated with implementing that advice. Yeah, he'd never seen the pain of dealing with you know the underwriting process for the insurance advice that they'd given. He'd never sat in front of a client and had to explain it to them. So yes. it was all these things, and he's you know. He, he then was looking to move into an associate advisor role and we said, well, you've got to go and do some admin and client service stuff first so you can see what's involved in the process and, and that's really value, valuable for him. And then he went to an associate advisor and advisor. And you know, he, he's a really fantastic success story within our business and for the industry, I think. Um, but the best thing that he did was everything we asked him to do, every role he had, he just did that to the best of his ability. Awesome. And- then he said, okay, now what's next? As opposed yeah. to going, you know, I want to be an advisor. What do I need to do to get there? Well, the short answer is be really good at what you're doing now <laughs> and then you'll get more opportunities. Yeah. And so it's kind of and, – and as frustrating as that might be, that will actually make you a better advisor when you get there. And, and so, you know, his time frame, you know, for, for my viewpoint was pretty quick. But, you know, I, I get that it might sound a long time for other people – but still, I think you've got to take those steps in the process. Like when you do your apprenticeship, you do yeah, yeah, you know, learn different skills along the way, and you don't start off with you know building a house on your day one of your carpentry apprenticeship. You start off with um, you know doing other more menial tasks to, to build on that and, and grow. So I think um, being willing to you know roll your sleeves up, do the best you can at yeah. what you've been given, and be really curious. Um, be really helpful and, and that's, you know, how you're going to get ahead more quickly. Yeah. Well, I mean, the weight of the job is so huge, right? You're literally giving someone advice on how to live their life and how to spend their money and use their money. Mm. I mean, goodness gracious. Like that is the, the, <laughs> it's kind of as big, a larger responsibility as one can have. So yeah, the idea that you, you can um, complete a degree and sort of walk into that, the, at the end of the day, we may not be as structured as medicine. But I've got a mate who's my age and I just <laughs> cough turned 40, uh, who's who's um, not yet a fully-fledged ICU doctor. And he has been at uni, was studying, I should say, for uh, almost 20 years. Yeah. So, including sort of undergraduate degrees and then graduate degrees and then medicines and, and specializations. And uh, and so he's probably maybe two years away from completing, and they don't they don't sneeze, you know. That's just that's how it's done. It's what you do, yeah. Um, and 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 of course, being being like the top dog at an ICU ward, you definitely want to know what you're doing. It's a yeah. huge weight of the job, um, but at the same time, you know, the the the, the massive weight of being a financial planner is is there as well, and and I think. When you see the outcomes, when you see the uh, like, let's say, let's say good and bad. Like, let's say someone doesn't listen to your advice. You need to see that, mm. uh, and you need to see what happens when they do listen to your advice. You need to see that. And you yep. need to hear the inflections in their voice when they regret that they didn't listen. You need to hear the elation in their voice when when they did, and you need to measure, or I should say, go along the journey of people experiencing changes in their life because we're doing quote unquote change management yep. in real time on a on a micro basis just within a family, not not a not a company, but it still is really, really hard. Yep. And those 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 soft skills are, are, are essentially the sales skills really ends up being not just the moment of sale, it's also selling every single step along the way. Exactly. Of right. of, of of implementing the 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 um the advice. I think that's right. And if you if you get good at that part of the process and, and helping somebody through the journey and along the way, then the sales part of it, which is often yeah the icky part of it, the people think about the hard sell. You don't need to do that. Yeah. So it's, it's about how you communicate and how you, um, I guess, educate people, get acceptance along the way. That can make it much easier. But that 
in itself is sales. Absolutely. But, but it's not the sort of high pressure sales. I think the other thing that, you know, is is evolving for us is that, you know, you and I know it's a really rewarding profession Absolutely. once you get to be an advisor and you get yeah. to see the value you provide and the relationships you build and you know, the, the deep purpose there is to the work that you do and yeah. the outcomes you're able to deliver and you can make a good living and, you know, you can have some flexibility because of, you know, you're dealing with people and that sort of stuff. So it's really rewarding. But people know more what a ICU doctor does right? and they make squillions of dollars and yeah. they save lives every day and that's yeah. kind of a, you know. It's pretty appealing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's been on all the TV shows and yeah. movies and you see that all the time. It, it, you know, it's not as clear for, for people coming to our industry why you would put that time into it yeah. necessarily unless you've had some more exposure to that, which is relatively unusual for somebody who's young. Absolutely. And 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 I guess this is kind of my, my final question, and that is what drew you to, into advice and then sort of as an addendum to that question, what made you be an early adopter of this of this you know pre fofa um you know what made you pursue, what made you get into advice and then what made you pursue your own what you thought advice could be i always liked understanding what was important to people what their goals were i always liked being part of a team and and, and my role within teams was always to you know more of a facilitator than the you know flashy star player or the try scorer um so sort of drew me to the advice was a way of, you know, I was interested in how money worked and, and the psychology around money and that sort of stuff as well. So I guess the combination of those factors was what what drew me to it. And when I, I was fortunate enough to get a role where you didn't have to have any qualifications or experience and they gave lots of training. So I kind of, you know, we got given a phone book and said, call 40 people and stuff, yeah. but they gave us the training, which was perfect. It was it was the only way I was going to get into the industry with totally. my background. Um but then once I, I got in there and got a bit of a, a grounding into it and we started to think about, you know, how you could go about helping people and, and the role I could play there. And I guess, you know, pivoting to when we went into the business side of things, it was more about helping people who were having the same challenges and opportunities as we were. And there wasn't a lot of people doing that. It was more about um, there was insurance specialists and there was, you know, retirement specialist kind of thing. That was the two predominant models in the industry at the time. Um, so there were people doing what we're doing, but not as many. So we thought, well, if we wanted to help those, it's very hard to go to another firm and you know follow their model, which isn't really consistent. So we decided to do it ourselves. And we had we've always had coaches and you know people supporting us along the way, so it wasn't like we did it just by ourselves. Sure, yeah. Um, but that was that was the main focus at the time for you know wanting to do it to a degree, do it our way, but for the people we wanted to work with um, and start from there. And that's built out over time, but that was kind of why we launched the business. Amazing. Um, any any sort of big so, – so I remember when, yeah, I think it was my first year owning the company and uh, I learned a big breakthrough in that you could charge two different fees – one was a percentage of funds under management, and one was an advice fee. And I that I just I remember for for as silly as that sounds, but I remember even just down to the 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 billing or uh, or the fee of the company, I started at a, at a base level, started separating out what it was that we were doing as a service, and and you know that that took on many different iterations over time. Um, but I still will never forget the time that I learnt that that was an option. Was there any kind of, even if it was a long time ago, any sort of pivotal moments in that journey that you took, including the time that you spent with coaches and, and that type of thing? Yeah, heaps uh, and heaps of them, um, you know, we got wrong and uh, learned from those as well. But I think, you know, on, on the fee side of things, we always understood pretty early that our clients didn't have big wads of thumb. So right. a percentage-based fee was not really going to be a sustainable way of doing it. Yes. So we were flat dollar fees from pretty early. Right. Um, well, from day one, basically. Oh, wow. Um, which meant we had to get pretty good at explaining out and yeah. articulating the value. Definitely. Because it wasn't necessarily linked to how much you had in your super fund because then we wouldn't make enough money to be sustainable. That's right. Um, so that was a really valuable lesson for us to be able to work out, well, you know, what are the problems our clients have? How does our proposition support the solving of those problems? Yeah. How do we continue to deliver value? Yeah. And a big part of that 
you know, in the early days was we used to be pretty good at delivering the upfront value and, and selling the upfront value. But we got to year two or three for those clients and it was kind of like, well, things are ticking along okay. Why do I need to keep paying you guys? Yeah. You know, at that time, probably, you know, a grand a year, which was a lot of money. Yeah. Um, you know, why do I need to keep paying you? So we had to yes. then get, well, that's a good question. Um, you know, had to get good at working out, well, what's our ongoing proposition? How do we keep a client? You know, absolutely. Obviously. Like I, I completely agree with you. It's it's a major thing that um you sort of get that two to three year mark in. You're like, oh wait, what I'm doing is working too well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do I do now? Yeah. Uh that what where was there anywhere sort of unconventional that you looked at to to sort of help you you know, kind of figure out the next steps or, or was it was it was it all pretty congruent to what you were already doing? It was more, we had, I, I think in some ways we had to get back to matching, you know, working on the tangible and, and intangible benefits of, of yes. the advice. And at various times, I feel like we've gone, you know, too far either way. Interesting. Um, so you had, you know, we got into, you know, tracking progress because often people will just look at well, how much money have I got in my bank account yep. and how much is my super worth, but they, they kind of forget, you know, how much they've paid off their mortgage you know, how much extra contributions they put into their investment account, which is ticking along every month and they've kind of forgotten about it, which is great. That's what you want. It's just ticking over. Yeah. So, you know, what's the value of that? What are the goals they've managed to tick off along the way? Um, setting up for their, their family or, you know, buying a new car or going on the, on the extra big holiday they didn't think they would have. But then saying, well, you've ticked all those things off. So what's next? You know, you've built this foundation. Mm-hmm. You've got some good habits in place. We've got a plan, but, you know, what comes next? So it's about, I guess, you've got to be, that's awesome. Rem- reminding them of what you've done, yeah. But then also reminding them there's more to come. It's like we can we can do some more. Yeah, it's like linking the previous success into you know projecting that forward. What what are the next things? Yeah, that's cool. And I still think there's an opportunity, yeah, you know, for technology to do that better. Like, but yeah, it's not quite. You know, we've got we've seen different things which do that okay, but we still do that pretty manually via yeah. a spreadsheet and then chuck it into a PowerPoint. Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of it's uh, not all the way there yet. I remember um when when memes first came out, you had inst, you know, Instagram and there was a picture and then you'd have words over the picture. I remember, at one stage I was talking about manual, which just reminded me, I w- you know, someone would say, Hey, I want to go to Rome in two years for my friend's wedding or whatever. And and so I would literally get a picture of Rome and then the text over that would be, you know, friend's wedding and that would that would sit in the document yeah. that that and then you'd have to sort of it was all very manual. Yeah. Right? Very manual. Um, yeah. There's some recent solutions that have come out. Um, I'd be interested to see if they can do what you're talking about because mm. it is – there is an element of the upfront, but then there's the ongoing and then how you link the previous to the future. Yeah. And, yeah. and some, of the, some of the modeling that you can get is about – you can model one goal. Yes. But can you model alternate paths or can you prioritize or yeah. you know, that sort of stuff it is a bit, bit more complicated. but. Yeah. That's where the real value is because very rarely does a client have just one single goal. <laughs> right. And then a linear path to achieve yeah. it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Mate, uh, look, I just wanted to thank you. It's been honestly a pleasure to to sit down and chat to you. And, you know, someone that's seen you uh, sort of uh, do what you've been doing for a long time, just want to thank you for sharing with us today, mate. No, it's a pleasure. And um, thanks for inviting me. It was good to, to reconnect. And, um, you know, as I said earlier, I really enjoy uh, and have learned a lot from, you know, listening to the podcast that you guys do and being part of that community as well. So keep up the good work there. Thanks, mate.